Hello everyone, so welcome to lecture number one. We're going to talk today about taxonomy and natural selection. We're going to talk a little bit about how we classify organisms and then we're going to jump into a little bit of evolution and natural selection. Um, this isn't really, we're not really going to get into detail. We're going to try to focus in this class on the topics that will help you the most for your major. But this is um, important stuff in, in biology. So we're going to talk a little bit about this. So uh, we'll start with taxonomy and natural selection. So we'll start with the three domains. So I'll go ahead and move this a little bit so you're able to see it. The three domains of life. So we're talking about bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. So we got three domains of life. Um, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. I'm going to be typing um, down notes as I'm explaining, so hopefully this can help you. Um, and these could be your notes. So you could take out a notebook, you could pause the video, take out a notebook. Um, you could take out, put up Word on your laptop, and as you're watching the video, you're typing down notes as well. Not only what I write, but also what I say. And this is really going to help you when it comes to test time. Um, so you can have these notes out while you're taking your test. Okay, so we start with the three domains of life. So we basically split um, everything that's living on Earth into three different domains. We got bacteria, we got archaea, and we got eukarya. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, all three, just very, very basic and briefly about them. But we split the three domains into six kingdoms, is what we call. So we have um, bacteria contains, um, it's also called eubacteria, if I can spell right bacteria and we have archaea which is also called archaea bacteria so that's a kingdom name which we'll explain a little bit um, in the next couple of slides and then eukarya which is all eukaryotes and that's when we split into um, a couple of different um, kingdoms so we got uh, protista we have plantae we have fungi or the fungi and animalia okay so that's basically how we split it up between domains and kingdoms. Um, so before we jump in, I just want to give a couple of different characteristics on, on each one. So we got bacteria over here. And bacteria, what, what defines the bacteria or makes bacteria so unique? Um, they are prokaryotes. They are single cell. It means only one cell. Unlike us, which are multi cell, we have many, many cells. And they contain no nucleus. Um, so their DNA is basically the cell, and then they have their, their DNA or RNA that's inside of them just floating around. They don't really have it inside a little brain. What we have is called the nucleus. So it's not really protected under a little nucleus. And that's a big difference between bacteria and eukarya or eukaryotes. Um, they also have um, what's called a lipid. Bilayer, um, so it's basically the surrounding layers made out of lipids, and then we also have they have peptidoglycan walls. So that's a that's all the cell wall that surrounds them. It's made out of pepti peptidoglycans. Um, they also have what's called fatty acids on their membranes. Um, something a little a little different or unique from archaea. And an example of some bacteria is E. coli, something we've heard about um, throughout our lives, little, little bacteria that really cause a lot of infections and, and problems in, in people. Then we're going to talk about archaea. Um, archaea are also prokaryotes. And they are also single cell. They also contain no nucleus. Um, but they can have either a lipid bilayer or a monolayer, so just one layer. Uh, bilayer means two, like double lipid, or they can just have one row of lipids. Um, they, different from bacteria, archaea can live in extreme uh, conditions. So this is what we're talking about, like old, old bacteria, like way back in the day, volcanoes and all those things. So these harsh, harsh conditions, archaea can live there. They can adapt to those living conditions. Um, an example is called methanogens. Um, 
these guys they basically um, are bacteria from sewage and they produce methane it's all that smelly stinky uh, all the smell all the stinky odors uh, around the sewages so we got these methanogens they live around those those extreme uh, harsh uh, ugly conditions what we call and then um, lastly we have eukarya which are the eukaryotes or or us um, eukaryotes are multicellular multicellular which is made of many many cells uh, as we all know um, they do have a nucleus it's also something really big so we have a nucleus we have our DNA inside our little nucleus so we protect our DNA inside the nucleus so everything that goes out of the nucleus is not the DNA itself but it's copies of DNA to make more cells and then um, some examples of um, eukarya um, so we're gonna say eukaryotes you know that term and some examples can be some plants some animals um, that's some fungi so all those the four different kingdoms that we're talking about and those are examples of eukarya or eukaryotes okay now in order to label or to classify an organism we go through this um, this different levels of classification or these levels of naming and it starts with um, with the domain so it's called Linnaean classification system so it talks about it starts with a domain a kingdom Let me make more room to teach you to, to see so let's label this real quick Linnaean classification system okay I'm trying to make these out as friendly as easy uh, for you guys so it's not confusing when it comes to to re, re uh, reading them again or, or um, restudying about these the main kingdom phylum class we got the order the family the genus and the species and in some cases the subspecies if needed um, but this is basically the classification system so what does this mean that means that every single organism has to go through all of these in order to have a specific uh, name that's why we have all these animals that are related to other animals or we're related to primates because they go through this these steps um, it's just it starts changing names so they can have the same order but different families and then or the same family but different genus or same genus but different species so they start branching off as you're moving up so um, I'm not going to specifically ask you to remember but this is uh, to remember anyone but this is um, the basic um, classification system I don't know if you guys remember in either in middle school or, or elementary school or even high school about um, dear King Philip or something like that there was this phrase where you could remember <laughs> remember each initial and then remember the classification system um, so for example if we're gonna talk about um, us homo sapiens so we have in this PowerPoint an example the domain is eukaryota and here on the right we have a little uh, quick little description so all organisms with cells with the nucleus and with the membrane and then we have the kingdom animalia so organisms that can move can move on their own and then we have chordata so organisms with a nodal cord or like a spinal cord so then it starts branching off so when we start with so we say all animals with the nucleus and then animals that can move on their own so animals that can move on their own they don't go to that kingdom any melee and then you keep going down um, organisms that are warm-blooded give birth to to live young young offspring then we have primates um, color vision large brain rotating limbs hominidae I don't know if I spell it wrong but <laughs> that's how I spell it uh, large brained ape and then we got homo in their genus which means a bipedal or two feet and then the species would be the sapiens the homo sapiens which is us so that's basically a little description of us as humans through the Linnaean classification system so you can go through any animal or plant or anything like that through this whole system and like I said um, this isn't really that relatable towards your major but we need to at least um, jump into it a little bit so here's an example remember we got to the animalia and then um, you keep going down with, with the spinal cord so automatically jellyfish goes out the clam goes out they have no spinal cord um, mammalia they have to be warm-blooded so alligators go out the sharks are 
part of a different um, class. They don't jump into that class. Um, carnivores, and you start going down and down. This is for uh, a dog, um, Canis lupus dog. Um, it's also, uh, there's a subspecies and it's a Canis lupus, but it's been um, familiarized or it's been, uh, it's been bred or trained to be like at home and those are the friendly dogs that we have. So this technically would be like a wild dog. Okay, um, so now, remember if this is going too fast or, something, or anything like that, you could pause the video, uh, go back, write down a couple of notes if you'd like, and, and then just keep going. So we're going to go real quick into how we write down the names of these organisms. So you'll see this a lot, like I just wrote, I put E. coli um, or Homo sapiens. You basically go from genus to species, and that's it. You don't really have to write all of them down. Um, you don't have to write um, all the kingdom and, and the phylum and the class and the order and the family and the genus and the species. So we basically bring it down, break it down to two, um, to two of the last uh, classifications. So that's what's called binomial, binomial nomenclature. So binomial nomenclature. So it's just basically um, the two name system. So we just we break it down to the two names. And it's going to be genus and species. Okay. Like that. Um, so now just um, rules of thumb or just rules when you write it down. Every time you're going to talk about a certain species, you're going to do a publication or an article. If you get into research or anything like that, um, you have to capitalize the genus. Um, and then the species is not capitalized, but it's, it's always uh, italicized if you're going to type it. So, for example, E. coli, so it's capital E, and then coli is lowercase. And then if you write it down here, it always has to be italicized. And if you're going to write it by hand, then you underline it. That's it. So it's just, it's just simple uh, naming that in science, if we don't really get specific on these things, then you just have all these random names that you don't really um, know exactly what a, a research article or paper is talking about. So that's the whole purpose of this. So we'll go ahead and, and keep moving on. Um, this is an example of, of a dog that I was talking about, Canis lupus, the genus and the species. So the correct way would be Canis lupus with italicized type or Canis lupus underlined if you write it down on a piece of paper. So it's just uh, pretty simple uh, naming in case we ever need it in the lab or anything like that. Okay, so now let's jump into um, some more interesting topics. We're going to talk about Microevolution. Microevolution. So, microevolution. So, microevolution, to define it, would be the change, the change um, in allele frequencies within a population over time. So, what's your definition of micro? Evolution, so micro small evolving or changing through time. So alleles, remember alleles is what we get from our um, from our parents. Um, we haven't really jumped into that yet in detail, but uh, we will once we get to our DNA sections. But these alleles, we have two alleles, so we have pairs. We get one from mom and one from dad. So what happens is the species evolve or micro evolve through time as they start getting different alleles from different parents which have been changed through time with different offspring. So all these different changes are going on and uh, different mating partners and your grandparents and your great-great-grandparents, all this changing of, of DNA and, and information that we have uh, as an organism is, is evolving. So we're changing um, through time. So for example, my wife's a dentist. And one thing that uh, she's noticed is that our, our, our molar or fourth molar, that many people don't have it anymore because we don't really use it that much. And she says that um, it's, it's, through evolu it's due to evolution, that we don't really have to go and hunt and bite these big pieces of meat, and only if we want to, and we want this big ribeye steak. But through time, we're not really using that anymore. Or even the, the, the pinky on, on your feet, um, on your toes, like that's, for some people, it's really, really small, and it's, it's getting lost eventually because we don't really have to grab many things with our feet because we use our shoes. So that's just a couple examples of evolution that's going on with humans through time. Okay. Um, so now evolution is due to four different things. So we got um, 
for processes of evolution, which we're going to talk about a little bit of each one. We have um, selection. This is what we've heard of, or hopefully even heard of in class um, in high school. We got natural selection, and we got artificial selection. So we're going to get a little bit into detail on each one of those. Then we have mutations. So these are mutations in genes or different mutations that, that occur in, in organisms or um, when having new offspring. Then we have gene flow or the flow of the genes through populations or interbreeding or changing um, or, or crossing different animals. For example, with dogs, when they're trying to breed different dogs, so the, the flow of these genes between the dogs, you get this like new species all of a sudden of a different type of dog. Like I have a husky. Apparently there's pomskis where they breed these Pomeranians with huskies and it's like mini husky with the with the Pomeranian size but a husky face and a husky husky body so it's like pomsky. So this is all the gene flow and the flowing of these genes throughout. And then we have what's called genetic uh, drift. Um, we're also going to talk in to I'm going to talk about a couple of different uh, subterms or little different terms inside of those four processes of evolution. Um, a little bit. So these are the main four that we have that cause uh, organisms to evolve through time. So any of these can cause evolution of organisms. Okay. So remember, if it's going too fast, make sure you pause it um, and check back uh, and, and write down more notes or, or, re or listen to it again. Now, um, in order to talk about natural selection, we need to talk about Mr. Charles Darwin. So you know, he has a, a famous quote. And it says, uh, it is not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. Okay, so this is this is very important because um, this is very true. So it's not that the biggest or the strongest um, organisms are the ones that survive. It's the ones that are able to adapt to the change around them. And you can see this uh, even right now where, where we're taking these um, these classes online and these times of COVID where everything's changing. So we have to change. I've noticed a lot of teachers that really haven't uh, used a lot of technology, but now online they have to. So they have to adapt to these changes of, of technology in, in the classroom. And, and not only that, but uh, in jobs or, or companies or, or anything like that, we have to adapt and change and move with the flow and, and make these adjustments as we go to the changes going on. So that's what Charles Darwin was saying that it's not the species that's really the strongest or the biggest. Uh, it's the one that can survive or can respond to the change in their environment and make adjustments. And that's something that I believe in life is <laughs> in general. No, it's very, it's very important. So and that was basically uh, what Charles Darwin summed it up. So we're going to talk a lot about a little, a couple of examples or observations that Mr. Darwin had. So let's talk about... Um, First observation is that offspring resemble their parents. This is very obvious. Don't you look like your parents or your grandparents or don't your kids look like you? So that's the one thing that Mr. Darwin saw um, when studying different organisms, that offspring do resemble their parents. So there has to be some connection, obviously, in the genes or somewhere um, between the parents and the kids and different changes. He's trying to observe like what these changes are or why these changes ha are happening. Um, now, offspring resemble their parents, but there's also variation um, within a population. Variation is just like difference. So there's also differences within uh, the population. It's not only between different populations, it's within the population itself. So he would notice that even though the population would be the same population, the same organisms, there'd be some differences between them. And that would be the variation he would see and through evolution or to changes or due to um, due to the environment. So some of those organisms inside that population would be a little different, even though they're all related. OK, now um, also he also noticed that most populations produce uh, more individuals um, than can survive. So what does that mean? That a lot of times uh, we just there's populations that just keep having offspring and offspring and offspring, and not all of them can survive. Not all of them have the genes or the the tools necessary to survive to the change or to survive to the habitat 
or the environment they're at. And we see this, um, unfortunately, with a lot of animals and more in the wild where um, they have to learn how to fly. And a lot of these animals, you see birds having um, four or five offspring and all of a sudden in their first flight, only one or two survive. So they produce more individuals than the ones that are able to actually survive um, and have those uh, favorable genes or traits. So that's another observation Mr. Darwin saw. Then we have, um, this is a little long, but I'm going to sum it down right now in a little, in a little sentence. So um, individuals with traits that make them better suited to their environment will survive and reproduce more, passing those beneficial traits to their offspring. So um, individuals with traits beneficial to the environment will survive and pass on their traits. So this is, uh, this makes sense, this makes perfect sense. So the individuals that are able to survive are the ones that are gonna have offspring. So if they have those offspring, the offspring will have those traits that made those individuals survive. So it's part of, um, it's part of the process, it's part of, of, um, of, of evolving and, and growing and reproducing that um, those individuals that are fit or are able to adapt to change are the ones that are surviving and passing on their genes. So that's why we're having all these new genes, but they're due to those individuals that did survive. So this is a little bit of, of common sense. Um, then we're gonna have, um, over time, more individuals in the population have the beneficial traits. So over time, beneficial traits, um, traits will predominate. If I can type. So what does that mean? Um, as time continues, as more offspring are, are reproduced and, and having more kids and more and more babies and everything, the ones with those good traits are the ones that are going to be predominant or going to be dominant in the population. So eventually, the ones with the least amount of traits, their percentages will go down because they start dying or they really can't reproduce. So you'll see through time. Maybe all of a sudden it was 50-50, and then through the year it's going to be 85-15, um, the percentage of different individuals. Why? Because some are more able to survive, so those genes are passed on, and the other ones are not. Okay. Now, um, this is what we call, or all these uh, observations, what Darwin called natural selection. So a big, big, big point on this is natural selection is not random. This is super important. It's going to be in your test. Um, so natural selection is not random. What does that mean? That means that um, nature does not select randomly. That means that it's specific to the organisms that they're going to select depending on how the environment is changing. So it's not going to be like uh, it's really hot somewhere and then these animals, all of a sudden, I'm just going to pick on the animals with the least amount of fur. No, it's going to be the animals that can are able to survive the heat, that have the, the temp, internal body temperatures, that are able to find the shade, that are, that are able to survive um, water drought. So it's specific to the environment it is. It's not really random. So nature doesn't really select randomly. Um, it is very specific to the environment and to the changes that are occurring. So natural selection is not random. We're gonna see that mutations may be random. Um, the flow of genes may be random because certain animals move certain places, genetic drift, uh, chance, um, different, um, different events that can occur and, and, and may get rid of some organisms, that may be random. But natural selection itself of selecting the least fit or the ones that are least able to adapt to change, that's not random, okay? So it's very important, that's why I capitalized it. Um, natural selection is not random. Um, and last, uh, the environment is constantly changing. So a trait uh, that offers an advantage at one point may be a disadvantage at another point. And this is this is true. There's actually, um, we'll see a couple of examples, but there's actually um, these certain species of fish that have only the eyes on, on one side. So some have it on the left side, some have it on the, eye, on the right side. So when they flow through the current, whenever they're going down the current, they're able to see the predators on this side. And the ones that have the eyes on this side they don't see the predators, so they're the ones that get eaten pretty fast. But when they move around and they go up the current, 
the ones with the other side, the eye on the other side are the ones that survive and the other ones don't. So this is a peculiar um, example, but at, at one point it can be an advantage, but all of a sudden the environment can change and it can be a disadvantage. So this, um, that's, very, that's very important as well. Um, there's a couple of videos that I would like you to see. I will post these links um, on, on the, I'll try to post them either on uh, the discussion where I put the assignment or or I could give it to you even during uh, on Wednesday during our meeting that we have, our live meeting in class. Um, but I'll try to post these um, somewhere on, on the week. And there will be a couple questions on these on the, from your test. So make sure you watch these. The first one is a pocket mouse. They're actually, they're pretty interesting, pretty interesting videos. They're about 10 minutes long. Um, and this one talks about uh, different mice and how they've adapted to the change in in the in the land or in the rock or in a certain area and now the dark skinned mice are the ones that are surviving when it used to be the light skinned mice so it's, it's actually pretty interesting so that's one example um, there's another example of lactose tolerance so this evolution of lactose or lactase in the enzyme so this can be more relatable to all your nursing students so this can be something um, maybe more interesting than animals themselves unless you go to a vet school but um, this is also another video. I'll put the link here just in case. But I'll make sure I, I post it somewhere um, on the on the Canvas dashboard. Okay. Um, and this one talks about how uh, humans are are becoming lactose intolerant or lactose tolerant and lactase, and you know get all these gases in the stomach and all that. So that's also another video. Um, now uh, a quick example of this. Um, evolution or natural selection is these peppered moths. I don't know if you guys have heard of them. Maybe you've seen them somewhere, but apparently what happened was during the Industrial Revolution, the trees would be a lighter color. So the moths that have lighter color on their wings would be the ones that would survive. Why? Because they would blend in with the trees. So the dark colored moths would be easily taken by predators because you can see them. I mean, you'll see, imagine this white wall and this black moth, you're going to see the black moth before you see the white moth. So that was just um, a perfect example of natural selection. Why? Because eventually industrial revolution occurred and then all these pollution and, and all the, and the, the gases and all the oil companies and everything that started producing these gases in the air that were dark was started changing the environment of the area. So these trees would be darker in color. So now the dark pepper and moths would survive. And the light ones would stand out. So now imagine this gray blinds that I have behind me. And having a white moth on the gray blind and a gray moth on the gray blind. The white one would be the one that would stand out. So this is this was like the first one of the first perfect examples of evolution uh, due to the environment changing. And maybe us causing this environmental change to these moths. So that's what the peppered moth is. It's a classic example of, of natural selection and, and evolution. Okay, so now talked about natural selection now let's get into artificial selection so artificial selection um, it means that we choose what we want so we artificially or we physically select what we want to reproduce so an example that we see is, is the corn um, there can be certain corns that are born but we don't need to grab all the seeds or what's been happening um, in commerce and and agriculture is that they're not really choosing all of the seeds they're choosing the seeds that produce the best corn so those are the only seeds that they're going to plant so we're not really letting the seeds that are produced just flow and, and produce the corn we're selecting the specific type of corn that we want to produce a specific type um, of food that we want so this is artificial selection so um it's um to define it, it could be uh, um, specific selection organisms. Um, let's see if I can spell again. Specific selection of organisms chosen. And if I could reword this a little better. Um, I'll just, I'll just make that. Um, we could talk about it in, in class on Wednesday if, if there's a little doubt. But this is basically we choose or we select specifically what we want 
to grow what we want to reproduce and that's artificial selection and it's been happening through crops through agriculture um, obviously you want the best type of vegetables the best type of food has been happening um, with the genetically modified um, um, foods GMOs and, and all that so um, now that, I don't know if you noticed but chicken wings are huge now everything they add into them or even the type of vegetables that we choose are, are bigger or they last longer so they can last through those um, packaging and transporting phases so um, it's just selecting specifically what we want not randomly specifically what we want to grow okay we see this in dogs um, you see all these variations of dogs and all of these are selected because we choose what we want don't don't a lot of people specifically choose a dog or a breed that they want they'll pay a lot of money for it um, I'm over here in in Mexico and you have all these more of of not really artificially selected dogs because you see dogs in the streets all over the place of different breeds but um, there's certain places in the world that have specific dogs that they want or they like or they have in certain areas and and you'll see that so um, that's also artificial selection selecting specifically the, the dog that they want now we have something else what's called sexual selection Okay, um, sexual selection. That's also uh, pretty interesting. So just um, organisms select the best or most attractive mate. This is also not random. Um, this, as you can see in this image right here, um, you have this bird. It, it's actually a bird. It may look like a blur. It's not Photoshop or anything. It's an actual bird. But what he does is he's trying to attract the female. So the male is the one that's like this trying to attract the female so the female can choose him and so he's doing he opens his wings and he's trying to be um he's trying to be all fly and fresh and, and look nice and look pretty so the female can choose him and he they dance they sing they they bring different things around the area and that's sexual selection so the females are the ones that have the choice and they choose which man they want to get um and that happens in these in these little birds and uh, it's sexual. It's not random. Don't we all choose a partner that we want? Don't we specifically choose someone with certain attributes or um, or certain traits that we want him to have? I want him to be six five with blue eyes and no mustache. Maybe, um, but it's that's sexual selection. It's not random. It's specifically choosing a mate or a partner um, to create offspring and grow um, the population. Okay. There's also a video on that, um, a quick little video. This one's only like two minutes or three, so this one's a little a little shorter um, for you to watch. Remember, there's going to be some questions on the test about these videos, so it's, that's sexual selection, um, where these um, organisms specifically select the sex or mate mating partner. Okay, and this one's actually of that bird, one of those birds uh, singing and dancing around and moving. Okay, now we have what's called um, genetic drift. Genetic drift. So let me kind of uh, underline these these subheaders. I remember at first we only put four: uh, selection, mutation, gene flow. Um, and what do you have in genetic drift? So this is one of them: genetic drift. So this is this one's really simple. Um, it's really only um, the drift of the change due to random fluctuations or changes um, in the frequencies due to chance events. So it's like you're walking by the street and you see a lot of ants and you start stepping on them. Um, it's not really the environment is changing or, or they have to adapt to your footsteps it's it's just a random chance a random event that kills certain species and now those species died and the other ones are the ones that have offspring so it's not uh, really this one is random it's not really specific to a certain target um it's mainly random it's just a chance an event happened a car accident somewhere on the woods killed some animals around there it's just random it's not really specifically targeting um, those animals or those organisms. So it's just random fluctuations um, flexible array in the frequency of these due to chance events or random events that are occurring. Okay. 
um, that's genetic drift. Now, there's two types of genetic drift that we'll talk about real quick. Uh, we have the founder effect, and we have the bottleneck effect. So, um, the founder just has a new founder. So, what happens is you have this population or this area, and then you pick, you specifically pick certain individuals to go found or create a new species somewhere else. That's the founder effect, where you pick uh, certain individuals and they'll leave that population and they'll start a new population. So then that new population is going to be specific to those two um, genes or DNA in those two organisms. And that's the new population growth. The bottleneck is kind of what we talked about, the random chance where something extreme happens. Most of the people are dead or most of the organisms are dead or animals are dead. And only the ones that survive start a new population. So that's genetic drift. Um, okay, so... Uh, founder, we put little subheaders here. Is um, um, take a group of organisms and create a new population. So you move them out. The the rest didn't die. You just simply took them out and created a new one. The bottleneck um, that will be most of the organisms died. And the leftovers, it sounds bad, but they're the ones that survive and create a new population. Okay. So those are the two subcategories of genetic drift. Um, this may sound fancy, but it's not genetic drift, just change randomly, something that can happen. Okay. Um, so here's a little more explanation. Uh, they're both random. You don't ever know what's, when it's going to happen. Um, the founder effect, um, they both are some smaller populations. Um, bottleneck is where most of the originals are, are killed and only a couple are, are left over and the ones that create a new population and the founder is when you have this parent population that means intact and you take out a couple and you create a new uh, a set of populations and eventually they may interbreed and come back together you never know okay um, so gene flow here's another one we have genetic drift and then we have gene flow. It's basically the flow of genes. So it's pretty simple. Um, but it's going to be organisms moving from population to population, um, just flowing through and just moving around. Some, Maybe some, as you can see here, maybe some in population one, tall red and a blue one. A red one decides to jump the fence or, her, or move a mountain or cross a river and go into population two. So now all of a sudden the flow of the genes is different because these animals decided to move places. And then the same thing happened the other way around. Someone from population two can jump back in to population one. So now you have this, these different changes. So in the picture you can have a certain uh, type of deer in one side, a certain color, but then there's this opening, they'll start moving around, wandering around. Um, and then this flow of, of different genes or different organisms starts to to be created and then now you have all this mixture of genes. It's not specific to only the orange colored deer or the dark colored deer. Now it's gonna be all kinds of mixtures and you're gonna have with spots and all those things. So um, that's how we got gene flow, okay? So um, to define it, um, the flow of genes between populations. Okay? So just moving around from one to the other. Um, so, uh, like I was saying, gene flow is a movement of genes from one population to another one. It is considered to be random, but maybe it cannot be random. Um, so we have a bee carrying pollen from one to another, um, a caribou or an animal from one herd mating with members of another. So it could be random. It could be they're just looking for food and they just move somewhere else. Or you could debate that maybe not. Maybe the area they're at um, doesn't have the food that they need, so they have to go and find food somewhere else. So that's specific. They're specifically trying to find something else in that other population that they can't find over here. Okay, so um, it's mainly random, but some people think it, it cannot be random. It depends. Okay, now um, we're going to talk about mutations. So this one could be more relatable to all your nursing majors. Um, this can be due to uh, mutations in DNA. Um, so mutations are random. Remember, natural selection isn't. But these mutations that occur are random. So every time more offspring are created, 
there's just mutations and there are mistakes in the um, in the processing or the replicating of genes or creating DNA or creating organisms that happen that have all these different characteristics in humans. Imagine if there were no mutations, we would all look alike. So that's the whole point of mutation. So they can be neutral, they can have no change, they can be good or they can be bad. So there's some mutations that really hurt an organism. There's mutations that can help an organism. All these movies of superheroes and superpowers and, and all these biohackers and all these things are due to mutations in DNA that can have this beneficial um, change to humans or to people. So it can be neutral, no effect at all, it can help them or it can hurt them. You never know. Um, so mutations are the major way in which new alleles arise. Okay, so let's write a couple things in here. Um, let me take out the underline. So mutations are random changes in DNA. Okay. Can be beneficial, detrimental, or neither. It can help or it can hurt or it can just nothing happen. It's just a random mutation that was just there. Okay. Um, and they um, give rise to new alleles or new different combinations. Remember, an allele is what we get from our parents, one from mom, one from our dad. So these new alleles arise with different combinations because our dad, when they were creating, or our parents, when they were creating us, and this mixture of, of genes and DNA, this mutation happens, and now we have this new allele, not very specific, similar, it's very similar to our parents, but it has some random mutation in it. So now it's very specific to us. So it's from them, but with a new mutation. So it gives rise to a new allele. And that new allele will then give rise to more new alleles. So that's how it's all working. So these are mutations. So like I said, this could be more specific to um, nursing majors. Um, for example, sickle cell anemia. You've probably heard of it. You probably have it. But you have these sort of DNA, different letters. Um, all of a sudden, we copy from DNA to RNA to protein. And we have a specific... Um, type of, of pattern that occurs to create a specific protein to create normal blood cells. But then when this is occurring, maybe an offspring can have a, an issue and there's a mutation in one of the letters. As you can see in this example, it's G-A-G, C-T-C. But if a mutation occurs, you take out one letter, G-T-G, instead of G-A-G, and C-A-C, then this create a new RNA sequence, a new, um, uh, a new protein or a mutant protein, uh, amino acid chain, and then you have this sickle cell red blood cell. So it's kind of like a sickle. That's the shape of it. That's what's called sickle cell anemia. So these red blood cells can then start um, clogging the uh, the arteries, and then you have these issues of hypertension. You have these issues of blood flow. Why? Because the blood cells are different. They're not circular. They don't have this constant flow. They have this weird different shape, and that's a bad mutation. So that's a detrimental mutation. So we'll talk about uh, sickle cell is a detrimental mutation that occurs in humans. So that's one of the examples. Um, spelled sickle wrong. Okay. And there's many others. There's mutations in, in proteins and in, in, um, in genes in different... Um, uh, for the eyes, it can be mutations. I know there's one... Um, it's called the DMD, uh, the Cheney muscular dystrophy, and it's just uh, kids all of a sudden can't create these muscle proteins. So it's this mutation where you don't have that mu that protein that creates those muscles as you grow. So the kids eventually start losing their muscles, and they have they die at a younger age. So this is a detrimental mutation as well. So there's different. I know there's different examples in in the medical field um, that you're gonna see or run into. So. And it just starts like this with mutations. Okay. And lastly, to finish off, um, we have this last term. It's called speciation. Okay. Um, so speciation, um, that just means if you have these two organisms um, that would typically interbreed or, or have offspring with each other, and they can no longer mate, so now we have two different species. So they split into two. That's called speciation. Just splitting into two different species. They can't have kid babies anymore, or kids, or organisms anymore, or offspring, and they split into two, and that's in creating two species or speciation. So um, when two previously interbreeding organisms 
can no longer mate and reproduce, two new species are created. Let me take off the underlining of this. Yeah. Okay, so we talked about um, real quick, we talked a little bit about taxonomy, the three different domains, classification, some, and the four main processes of evolution. So remember, if you have any questions on any of these, we'll talk on Wednesday. Wednesdays from 6 to 7.30 in the discussions. Make sure you write down, make sure you write down questions or, or any comments or anything you would like to talk about. We can talk more in detail. Okay, so thank you for watching. I'll see you guys soon.